Hello there, welcome back to another week of shows. Um, been away for a week or two. It was longer than planned. I, my plan was I had a lot of films to watch, some series of film things that was it was hard to do the film, watch the films and do the videos because uh, there was uh, quite a few to catch up on. So I took a week off. Then I got a cold, which brought me back a week. I've still got the cold, but it's not as bad as it was. Now it's just annoying rather than horrible. And now you can actually hear what I'm saying rather than being like, Ooh. so. Never do videos. So my first video is on Graveyards of Honor. This is the two versions of Graveyard of Honor. One is the original. It's from Kinji Fukumatsu. There we go. And you get the remake from Takeshimiki. And you also get this nice little booklet. You get the booklet and you know it's all very nice. It's a very nice package. I would recommend getting this before it sells out because I think it will sell out pretty quick because it's a rarity and a lot of people I know are buying it. I think it's one of those ones that's buying a lot of people because everyone kind of suspects it will go out pretty quick. So um, I'm sure you'll get like them individually later on but the box set, when the box set, it's time to buy it now I think. Um, okay, I'll go, I'll go to the first one. Um, Graveyard of Honor. Kenji Fuka Sumu. I'm absolutely awful at this guy's name. I've done so many videos on him and I've still butchered his name repeatedly. <laughs> you know, what can you do? Basically, what this film is, this was um, based on the story of an actual Yakuza who was um, called Rikuo Ishikawa. Which I'm reading directly from this, so I probably still butchered it. Um, and basically, um, he was played by Tetsuya Watari in this version, and he, um, who you would recognise from Outlaw Gangster VIP, which I did a series of I did a video on the series about a month ago or something like that. So I've just covered him in one of his earlier series of um, successes. This is a slightly older version of this actor who died recently. And this is probably, from what I've seen, this is his best role. This is um, him at his peak, because he's working with a really good director and a really good part, and it's it's quite an achievement in his performance, because it is very different from what he was doing at Old Gangster VIP, where he played a very noble person. This guy here, in this film, is the exact opposite. Now, the, the film that it resembles most from the same director is Street Mobster. I mean, the director did Battle for Honor, Street Mobster, he did um, Cops vs Thugs, Battle Royale. He did a lot of films, Virus, but the but Street Mobster was the one before where he was taking a, a low level gangster and watched him basically get everything wrong and collapse and end up getting killed by his own people. This one's a bit different and. It's a bit more epic. It takes place after, just after the um, Japanese have lost the war. That's where it starts. And it takes place pretty much through the fifties as well. And basically, it starts off with the, this monster who grew up, you know, in the ruins, you know, <clears throat> of the war, and had to try and make a living out of out of pure despair and all these like shanty towns where everybody was trying to make a living, try not starve to death because the industries had been destroyed and everybody's ability to make a living had been destroyed in some of the certain areas and he was trying and he's, he joins in Yakuza to make a living basically but according to them from all the information you get he always wanted to be a Yakuza anyway so he'd have gone in that direction no matter what it wasn't like it was forced into this, he was a born Yakuza. But he was also a born nutcase. He was, this is a guy who's so self-destructive, so unaware of his own instincts, that he does almost everything against what you'd expect from a Yakuza. In any film, really. Because in Yakuza, in most films, even if they've been sneaky, they're outwardly, um, bow to the boss, he's outwardly show respect. They don't talk about them behind their back which you'd get from this director's other films. And this one, this guy doesn't care. He'll openly disobey orders, openly get in trouble. And then as the film goes on, he will openly attack his own boss. He doesn't care. He is um, 
and a, a, a wild animal, he's a law unto himself. The closest you're going to get to this performance in any other film is probably uh, Pacino and Scarface, that kind of animalistic weirdness that very few actors will go for because it's very hard to pull off. But we're carrying this one really pulls it off. This is just, he's just so good and so much of a focus in the filming. You, just, you always watch him and you can't quite figure him out, even though you're trying to figure him out. He's always this mystery figure that you can't quite get a grip on. What is he? What does he want? Why is he doing all this stupid stuff? What's the point of all his actions? And you never figure it out entirely. All you get is clues that he was always like a, a child who was needy. And he wanted to be a Yakuza, to be an important man in the underworld. And he just seemed a very sensitive figure, but he was a very violent figure. And um, the place he came from was a similar place, I think the same place the director came from. And he's, I think the director said that the place is like, it's a place where people learn to start thinking, using their bodies to get what they wanted. So it wasn't a navy full of people who had a lot of forethought. And this person, even though his view is intelligent, always took the way out of, I'm going to do what I want to do, no matter if it offends anybody. And his epitaph was that uh, 30 years of raising hell. <laughs> you know, that was his view of his world. Well, basically, what the film does is just show you this man in his world. And it also shows you a lot of stuff in the Japanese culture just after the war. Some of the stuff you probably won't know about. Um, you've got the Chinese who are in Japan at the time who um, are being protected by certain um, corporations and things but the Yakuza hate them and the police hate them and um, they're getting beaten up repeatedly and their territories are getting stolen by the Yakuza including our main gangs and his pals and you see a lot of scuffles there and the, gang and the cops will arrest the Chinese for stuff and let the Japanese go because it's very racist, very biased country this is where the gang are born with one of the local gangs, even though he's very tied to his own gang. But, but this gang's telling him, look, just come with us. It's better for you to come with us. You're more like us than you are with those old-fashioned guys. He doesn't listen, which causes half the problems. If he'd listened and moved with the other guys, he'd probably done a lot better. He'd probably have still went to the same end, but he'd done a lot better. But the guy actually starts to... Um, do things that because because his boss has a lot of deals with the U.S. Army who are around and they're smuggling stuff to the U.S. Army and a lot of black market stuff going on and they're the respectful side of the Yakuza so they can have those deals and our gangster just keeps on messing it up and keeps on causing havoc for them and keeps on like attacking enemies. At one point, he basically sees an enemy who's trying to move into his territory. Decides, sees, his, sees the guy's girlfriend, falls his girlfriend into the bathroom, tries to rape her. Then when the other guys come and try and help protect her, he starts slashing at those guys and causing a ruckus, which ended up causing a gang war. Stuff like that. And this is during a time where some of the gangsters, some of the old Yakuza are trying to actually go into politics to get some political power. And he's just messing all this up. Because he doesn't care. Now stuff like that, like, the guy's a rapist. He's, like, they don't even try and hide that the guy's a rapist. He, the person turned into his common law wife, it's the first time he meets her, he rapes her and steals her money. And she keeps on going back for more and there's this weird perverse relationship that just gets odder and odder and she seems to be like a masochist, she seems to need this and he seems to enjoy giving her the pain and it's a really weird twisted relationship but very fascinating because it's like it goes into some of the things like who would go with a yak as a person, who would actually, what kind of per woman would actually go with this and it's like it looks into that as well. It never gives you an explanation, it just shows you different types of women who go with, who fall for the Yakuza and have their own different ways of dealing with them. Because it's a film with a lot of characters and a lot of character beats that aren't explained, they're just shown for what they are and then you have to interpret them yourself. That's what's great with the film, it lets you interpret everything yourself. It does not give it to stop for speeches, it just shows you this is what it does, this is how people react, on to the next thing, on to the next thing. It's only about an hour and a half long, so it always feels like it's going firing through the story. And it creates this chaos within the story. It's always a sense of, 
you don't know what's going to happen next because in 10 minutes the film could have gone completely insane. You've got scenes with uh, the lead character in jail because he's in jail quite a bit in this film and he's having to deal with uh, people try to kill him for the various things he's done to the bosses and to the other people because the Yakuza kind of start to hate him after a while and he just becomes more vicious than any other gangster so that he can protect himself. And it's just this guy's a madman. And he ends up getting expelled from Tokyo for 10 years because he's so crazy. And he does try and kill his own boss. And he cuts him up pretty badly. And he's cut up other, other top gackers in the, in the territory. And he's, at some point everyone's just like, we cannot deal with this guy. We either we kill him or we expel him. So they expel him. Which is a... Well, everyone lives to regret because they should have killed him. <laughs> but... He just doesn't seem to be able to be killed. He seems to survive almost anything. And he goes he goes to another he goes in the exile for a world in our town, develops a drug addiction because he gets fascinated by a prostitute scene who is high at the time of which is screwing him basically. And he pays her money to try it and he, he gets addicted to heroin. So when he comes back he's now a heroin addict as well as a violent person, so he's always going for the next fix. And he doesn't clear who he rips off. Which includes his only friend in the Yakuza, who is we up in the world and who's a, now a, his own family, his own boss. He's his own boss and friend's little family. And seeing his old friend come back causes him havoc because he has to try to protect this guy, but this guy's insane. This guy doesn't seem to appreciate any help he gets. And he ends up killing his own friend. That's how weird and whacked out he is. And basically by the time the police are after him, the Yakuza want to kill him as well, and everyone wants to kill him. And the irony is, this has been a spoiler, but it's, this film's been out for years, so I don't really care about spoilers. The irony is, the only person who can kill this guy is himself, you know. He's so self-destructive, he's so dark. And he's so in his own head, and he doesn't care what else thinks. The only person who can really destroy himself because there's been so many scenes of people trying to kill him and he gets brutally injured and he always survives. He just always comes back. And Watari is so good at it because he underplays it. He doesn't go way over the top. He always sense of that's a guy that can go way over the top at any point. There's always this danger of a sense of threat. He's always a very colourful character, but he always keeps it under control to the degree of performance to portray a guy who's out of control. But he's not a guy who's doing a massive broad performance, he's a guy who's doing a broad performance with care. And it's just wonderful how he does it, it's just such a good performance. And his relationship with his common law wife is amazing, it's so ambiguous and so dark and it's so destructive to both of them and he just destroys her life. And when she finally dies, there's a scene where he tries to intimidate other gangsters because he's got her body being cremated. He starts to chew on the bones and starts to consume some of the ashes off her and it's like, I can't believe I'm watching this, this is insane. The whole movie is insane, the whole movie has this weird sense of chaos, this sense of what should happen in a gangster movie versus what's actually happening in this movie because it shows you how out of control the yaks actually are and how polite a typical gangster movie is. This is one of the best gangster movies ever made, this is easily on the same level as the Godfather movies, you know, it's got it's that level of greatness. It's just so good. It's so outstanding. The acting's terrific all the way through. The sense of forward chaos and momentum just creates this world that and it's never been matched by anybody. You know what I mean? Um, they always say Scorsese films are intense, but they're nothing compared to this. This is intense. This is like 90 minutes, and you. But as you watch, you feel more and more exhausted because you don't know what's going to happen next. It's always going crazy on you. It's always nuts. So this is a stunning, stunning film, which I've just scratched the surface of talking about. It's just crazy. It's just, and it's a film that can never be made the way it was made that time. It was a certain director at a certain time in his life, the right actor. And it just, everything came together. The proof of that is in the remake, which is by Takeshi Miki who is always up for crazy stuff and it stars Goro Kishitani as the mobster 
and when when Mickey is the one who makes a more conventional film, that shows you how weird the original film is. Um, this is a good film, but it's not as good as the original. It's too long. It's two hours long when the original is an hour and a half, and you feel that extra half hour because the original just fires through all this insanity. The remake updates it slightly. I mean, the original took place in the 50s and I think early 60s, and this one takes place in the 90s, 80s and 90s. Apparently it's closer to the actual story of the guy because the original took the story and then invented certain things based on what happened in that era as well. But it actually feels more realistic than the remake, which is closer to the facts apparently, but feels more manufactured. Because it doesn't have that craziness that the original has. But it is still very good. It's still a very good film. It's just too long. It just takes too much time in each section. Just um, It gets to the point and it keeps going for another five, ten minutes each time. And that's the problem with the film. It never quite knows when to quit. The lead performance is good. It's very good performance. But if you've seen the original performance by Watari, it looks like a tame in comparison because where Tari feels like a guy who's insane. In this performance, he, feel, he feels like an actor played a very good performance of a guy who's insane. There are some wonderful moments that I mean when he becomes an addict and he ends up going through this, his house in his back and shooting around when he's crazy. There's stuff like that that's wonderful. And his interactions with people are really cool because you, you do have a sense that there's a guy who will explode at any opportunity. But you don't quite get the same madness. You actually find out why he does certain things a bit more than the original. And that takes away the sense of dread he has. He feels less a threat in this one. He feels more of a crazy character. But people can work him out more. It's not quite the same thing. It's not quite people um, forgiving him too many times and he always comes back and makes him regret it. And this one. They get a handle on him pretty quick. For the first half hour, he's a member of the Yakuza, and then at a certain point, they realise he's crazy, and then the next hour and a half, it's his downfall. In the original, he's given so many chances to come back, and they always give him a dark chance when they shouldn't, and it's some odd with the society of the Yakuza and the Yakuza system as well. Of how they keep on feeling they should try and bring his girl back into the fold, no matter how much he causes trouble. And the remake, it is more conventional, they have to hunt him down. He makes these bonds, which he ends up betraying because he's crazy. But it doesn't quite feel the same way. He has a, he has a girlfriend again, and his common-law wife, and they, they get married. And this time he doesn't eat her bones. <laughs> she just commits suicide at a certain point. The, um, there's a lot of scenes that repeat themselves from the original, like uh, the moment when, when they catch him, he's um, crazy, and he's shooting the police, and until he then gives up and he runs out of bullets, which isn't as crazy as the... Yeah, because I threw rocks at him because the police are around or anything from the original. It's, it doesn't quite have the same insanity that is original, which is his big downfall. It's just like, it's a very good film based on this life. But if you've seen the original, the original is so much better. This is just a very good film. It's just, but it's broader. I mean, it does feel campier in a weird way. It does feel like it's a performance piece. It's like a bit theatre based on this other film, this other life rather than a pure introspective look at the craziness of this guy because by updating it they make it about Japan in the 90s after the after the peak and the, everything's now falling down and people are struggling to make ends meet because uh, the economy's collapsed which is interesting but it doesn't quite have the craziness of post-war Japan when everything is desperate and then them try to pull themselves out of that this one feels a bit more normal, feels a bit more like a normal Japanese movie. It does not feel unique in any way. And that's his downfall. It just feels like it's a very good gangster movie by a guy who is just formed because of his own stupidity. It doesn't have that kind of absolute light in a bottle craziness the original had or something like Scarface has it. It just it's just a bit normal. It's a bit ordinary compared to what came before. That's weird because Miki directed it and there is a lot, a lot of weirdness. There's a lot of strangeness. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about this guy coming in, trying to commit suicide, this guy 
into all sorts of hijinks and he's smashing people's over the head with a like a cigarette, an ashtray and stuff like that. He does all this violence, as it does feel more violent, but just theatrically violent, it doesn't feel as impactful the violence. Which is a big thing. I mean there's scenes where he ends up the expanding idea of his best friend who he bonds with in prison, who protects him when things go wrong and he ends up turning on. That's expanded on, but it's not as impactful as the original, which is simpler, but it actually has more of a punch to it because this guy stuck up from for less and they still get destroyed. In this one, they make up they were much more friends. And it just it doesn't quite connect as well. It just, it's just not as insane. And the whole film is just kind of like that. It's not quite as insane as it could have been. It's just, it's fine, but it's not quite the, the wonderful trek through madness that the original was. It's just a, a very good Miki film. But it's not Miki at its peak. I mean, compared to Gozu or Edition, this is very kind of conventional Miki. It's, it doesn't have the, uh, you know, Ishii the Killer. This is, did not have the Ishii, the Miki weirdness of this era. Because it was made in the early 2000s. So it feels a very conventional film for Miki and for a, a remake of this film. But it's still a good film. It's still very enjoyable. But to be honest, given a choice, I would watch the original anytime, really. And the remake I'd watch once in a while. That's just the way it is. It's a good film, but it's not great. It's well acted, but it's not as impactful when we acted as the original. The original feels raw and it feels like everybody knows what they're doing and having a good time because the director had a stock company of actors he was bringing to this one. The, in the new one, it feels like everyone's playing gangsters because I've seen gangster films and they've been in gangster films before. But it's kind of stock gangsters compared to what we saw before. So that's a remake. Good film, not great. I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope it didn't go on for too long, um, but that's my thoughts on the Graveyards of Honour films. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back to another one. Right, bye for now.